Hey y'all, welcome back. So I got a really interesting topic for you today because it's something that you will not learn in school. They will not teach you in your academic or online or Kaggle competitions that you do around machine learning and data science, but I guarantee you will absolutely run into in your professional career at some point. And so with that said, let's dive into an example of where this comes up. So we're going to assume, as we did in some previous videos, that you are the data scientist at a streaming company called Statflix that hosts a bunch of movies online. Now let's say you just have five movies, it's a relatively small company, and right now this is what percent of all of the views go to each of these five different movies. So Toy Tale gets 30% of the views, and Insect's Life gets 25, The Invincibles gets 20, Searching for Nemo gets 15%, and finally Trucks gets 10%, and hopefully these add up to 100%. Now what the ask is, is you want to create the first recommendation model at Statflix, which is going to recommend good quote-unquote good movies to your users and this is hopefully going to make your users happy and create a good product overall. Now you start really basic when you think about how I'm going to build this model. You look at this data and you say you know what Toy Tale and An Insect's Life are the most popular movies right now. They have the highest share of views and so my recommendation model very very basic model here is simply just going to recommend these two movies to users. So when user comes to the Statflix website, they're going to say, hey, you should watch Toy Tale, or hey, you should watch An Insect's Life. That's it. That's your model. Now, let's think about, you've released your model now. Let's think about a month later, what might happen to this distribution of percent of views for these five movies that you have. So one month later. Well, if we think about it, your model is now actively recommending these first two movies. And so it would make total sense for the share of views for those movies to go up and the share of views for the other movies, which your model is not actively recommending, to go down. And that's exactly what we see. We see that Toy Tale went from 30 to 50% of all views and Insect's Life went from 25 to 40 and the others shrank by a lot. 20 to 6, 15 to 3, and 10 to 1. So 90% of all views are now among Toy Tale and An Insect's Life, which are, of course, the two movies that you recommended that people watch in the first place. Now, this by itself is, well, interesting. It's definitely something to think about, but it doesn't seem like necessarily a problem. Where we start entering the territory of this maybe becoming a problem is what happens when we think one step ahead. And the reason that this is not taught in your academic courses or Kaggle competitions or on your online courses. And that is what happens when we try to train our next iteration of this recommendation model. So when we go think about those things, academic courses or Kaggle competitions, usually it's a very self-contained project. Here's some features, here's the label you're trying to predict, train me a single model. You're just going to train this thing once and you're trying to get the best performance on some metric that we care about. What they usually don't think about is what happens in a real life setting where you're not just going to train your model once. Ideally, you're going to be training this model once, and then you're going to be using the training data later to come up with the next version of this model, then you come up with the later training data to come up with the next version of that model. Model training is not a static process as much as academia would have you believe. It is an iterative process. You need to retrain your models, keep them up to date, make sure that they're getting better and better, or at least staying the same over time as your training data changes. And so with that said, let's say that now there's an ask to train the next version of your recommendation model. And so you go about it in the exact same way. You say, hmm, let me look at the training data that I have right now. And this is a bit of a hint of what the problem is going to be. But this is the training data we have now. And as we know, that is at least partially because of the first model that you trained. So a little bit of a hint right there. But either way, let's say that, okay, this is the training data I have. Let's pick the two most popular movies. Well, that happens to be A Toy Tale and An Insect's Life again. And we're going to have our next recommendation model prioritize those even more. It's going to push those even harder than it did before because these numbers are relatively higher than the numbers they had even before. And so we're going to go even harder and say that users should get recommended Toy Tale and An Insect's Life because they're even more popular, have an even higher percent views than they had in the first place. Now what that does two months later, so we assume that one month later is checking in after your first model had a chance in the wild. Now two months later is after your second model, which we're already getting this weird feeling that it was trained on data from your first model. But either way, two months later, your second model has been in the wild for a while. What has happened to these percentages? Well, we find that for Toy Tale, it now has 55% of all of the views. 
An insect's life has 45% of all of the views. If you add those up, that's already 100%. And so by definition, you have zeroed out all of the other inventory that you have on your website. So these two have again gone up, these have gone up, and the other ones have gone down to their absolute minimum that they can get to. And now we start getting into the territory of this might be a problem if we are leaning into the biases induced by our first model. Because our first model had some idea of what to recommend, and that recommendation probably had an effect on what our training data looked like in order to train the next version of the model, which is in turn gonna make those recommendations even more popular later, and eventually we get into the situation where the only thing that people are watching is these two movies in our inventory that we have been recommending, which did have a big share in the beginning, but now they have the entire thing and people aren't at all watching the rest of what's in our inventory. And this problem goes by a lot of different names. There's not like a standardized name for it, but one that I've heard before is feedback loops which makes a lot of sense because when you're training your second version of the model, that's going to be using training data that is generated by the first version of your model. We're going to explain that graphically in just a second. Another name you might hear by is selection bias. In general, this is happening because the training data that you fed into the second version of your model has a selection bias since it's induced by what the first version of your model has recommended. And so let's get into that graphic here. T1 here is the training data you're using in the first time period. So that's this table right here before you had any recommendation model. M1 is gonna be your first recommendation model. So this arrow basically says your first recommendation model was trained on this training data from the first period. Now here's the key. Here's the key that leads to all of our problems. And that is that this M1 is gonna be responsible for generating the training data T2 that you see in your second time period, one month later. And it's exactly this training data that's gonna be used to train the next version of your model, M2. And so this is the causation chain. And so what we actually find is that the first version of your model, indirectly through these two arrows, but there is a causation here, the first version of your model is impacting what the second version of your model looks like through the avenue of generating the training data that's gonna be fed into the second version of your model. And that's exactly, folks, that is exactly the nefarious and often not really studied feedback loops problem in machine learning models. And you can just continue this process indefinitely. So you imagine that you're on your 10th, your 20th, your 100th iteration of this model, and it's just been leaning into its own biases since the very first training. And that is probably not something that we want and it's something that we want to be aware of. So this is the feedback loops problem that you're going to deal with in almost every use case. And it might not seem like it at first. For example, think of some random other use case. Spam detection for emails is a classic one. So when you're doing spam detection for emails, you're going to train your first spam detection model. It's going to output some probability that an email is spam. You're going to have to draw some kind of cutoff. So you might say if there's an 85% chance or higher that the email is spam, then I'm not going to deliver it to the user. Now, your model might be correct about that, but it could also be wrong about that. So for that percent of emails above 85% threshold that were not sent to the user, some of those could have been perfectly good emails, but they're not going to be part of your next set of training data because the user never got them. So basically, after one iteration of your spam detection model, you're already restricting the set of emails that the next iteration of your spam detection model is going to train off of. So the feedback loops problem, I firmly believe, is going to arise in any domain where you're expected to train iteratively these models and improve your models over time. And this can actually get in the way of that without you even noticing. So now we understand the problem and we can see what weird situations it gets you into where all your inventory is just unused. And, and granted, Invincible Searching for Nemo and Trucks did have a pretty decent base of people who were interested in them. If we add up these 20, 15, and 10, then we get that 45% of people were interested in these movies and now nobody even has a chance to view them because our recommendation model is pushing so hard for these other two movies. So that doesn't seem correct. And so the question now is how do we avoid this? How do we mitigate this problem? And that's what this little causal box down here is gonna be trying to explain. So let's explain this again in a way that might solve or at least mitigate the feedback loop issue. So the first step of the process is the exact same. We have some initial set of training data. Here we don't need to worry about the feedback loops problem, because by definition, that problem is only going to arise once we have a model 
uh, that has been trained. So right now there's no model, we just have a bunch of data. So we're gonna assume that same thing as before, model one is trained off of this training data from time period one. So we draw our arrow there. Now, now here is one way that folks go about solving the feedback loops problem. The crux of the issue, remember, was that before all of our training data in time period two was generated from our model one. We're going to break that single causation and we're going to introduce an element, a very important element in most machine learning applications like this called diversity. So diversity. And there's so many ways you can define this, but the crux of it is this. Diversity is going to make sure that the training data you're generating in time period two is not solely a function of the model that you trained in time period one. Yes, that model is still going to have a big influence. It's still going to definitely have an influence on the training data that gets generated in time period two. But crucially, we're also going to introduce very intentionally some diversity in generating that training data. And so let's explain what this might look like. So let's go back to our concrete example we are working with here. When we train that first recommendation model, it said that toy tail and an insect's life should be the things that are recommended. Now, we're gonna trust that for the most part, but we'll still sample for maybe five or 10% of users something else from our inventory just in case our model was incorrect or just to get a little bit of more signal about those other things and not lean too far into what our model is telling us. So for example, for that five to 10% of users, we might actually sample some random other movie from our inventory, like the Invincibles or Searching for Nemo or Trucks. And so those things still are going to have more representation. So these numbers no longer look as stark. This 6%, this 3%, this 1% will actually be higher will actually be higher than they are before and therefore will be able to contribute more to training the next version of our model. We're going to be intentionally diversifying away from what our model thinks. You can think of this kind of like a hedge against your model, trying to make sure that you're not leaning too far into your model's predictions just in case they're off or just in case they induce too strong of a selection bias. And that story also means that there's an arrow that we need to draw in this diagram which is that the model that you train itself is going to influence what this diversity looks like. So this arrow means that the way you do diversity is going to depend on what your model prioritizes. For example, in an alternate universe where instead your recommendation model was pushing for searching for Nemo and trucks, then your diversity algorithm would look different. In that case, you would want to exactly promote toy tail and an insect's life more. So the diversity algorithm depends on the selection biases that have been learned by your model. So the model impacts the diversity, and then it's that diversity and that model that together are going to impact the training data that gets generated in time period two. And this is the key improvement. This is what is going to hopefully prevent or mitigate the feedback loops in the future. And that becomes clear when we draw our final arrow, which is the same thing as before, where we again use the training data from time period two in order to train the model two which is the next version of our recommendation system or the next version of our spam filter or the next version of whatever model it is that you're training. So now if we look back and think about what are the factors that are affecting our second model, well, that's going to be the training data from our second time period. And what is that affected by? It's still affected by our model from the first time period. We're not getting away from that, but we are hedging against that because it's also affected by the diversity. And you could say, hey, but the diversity is affected by the model, so doesn't everything come back to the first model? Well, this arrow is actually kind of a hedge. This arrow we drew between the model one and diversity is not saying that diversity is correlated to the model. Rather, we are anti-correlating the diversity from the model. We're saying learn the diversity to be intentionally different from the model, which all in all means that the training data in time period two is a function of the model and something that is anti-correlated from the model. So kind of diversify, hedge, regularize, whatever is your favorite word in this case. And you can see how this process just continues. So when you're ready to generate the third version of your training data, which is created by the second version of your model, you're introduced diversity again, except that diversity will be tied to whatever selection biases are learned by the second version of your model. So uh, concretely, we have another diversity node right here, and then we connect them up in the exact same way. That's gonna be affected by the second version of your model, and then these two are going to go on to affect uh, down there, the next version of the training data that you would create. So maybe this seems like kind of a niche topic, but the reason I bring it up is kind of as a public service announcement because I've seen so many times in industry, and this again goes back to the fact that this is not something that you really learn in academia or when you're doing Kaggle competitions because those are usually just training a static model 
do your best on a performance metric. Don't worry about retraining this model in the future. So this problem only really comes up when you start working, doing professional work in data science or statistics or machine learning. And at that point, the awareness has not usually been built. I know it wasn't there for me, so I was kind of mind blown by this whole thing when, when I had to think about it. And because the awareness is not really there, you get a lot of professional data science and machine learning applications where people don't even think about this. They don't even think about the diversity. They just train version one, version two, version 100, version 1000 of their model. And the feedback loop has just been there the whole time. And the longer you let it go on, the harder and harder it is to recover from that feedback loop because your model has gotten so specific and maybe your users have gotten so used to the way it works now. So introducing diversity becomes more and more and more costly as you let this problem continue. And so it's really best to start thinking about it at the very beginning of your project. So I'm hoping you all enjoyed this video. Please, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Of course, any comments are welcome in the section below. And I'll see all you wonderful folks next time.